This week, uh, we're taking a look at poverty and homelessness on the island. On Monday and Thursday, the select committee of Tim Ward uh, looked at poverty, heard oral evidence uh, along from two sessions from organisations helping people who find themselves in need on our island. We're joined by guests Neil Mellon from the Isle of Man Food Bank, Don Bailey, Director of Housing Matters, Erica Irwin from Gry, and Tanya August Hansen, MOC, who sits on the Select Committee on Poverty. And joining her is Jason Morehouse, MHK, who also is on the committee. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for coming in on a Sunday lunchtime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bob. Okay. Um, I don't know. Let's start with Don. Um, homelessness on the island? Do you see evidence of it? Most of it's hidden, and that's the problem we've had over the years. People, or a lot of people, used to believe there wasn't a homeless problem because it wasn't visible. But there is a very great homeless problem here. Out of sight, out of mind, as far as a lot of people are concerned? Yes. A lot of homeless people are doing what we call sofa surfing, where they're staying with friends. Uh, but that's only a temporary measure, and sooner or later they run out of friends and they run out of having a roof over their heads. So you don't tend to see people sleeping in doorways like you do in the UK, but we do have people sleeping rough, uh, living in tents, sleeping in public toilets, sleeping in car parks. As far as your organisation is concerned, how does it help the population then? What's the aims of your organisation? We help to deal with both prevention and cure. So, for example, we have a peer education programme where we visit schools, to educate youngsters on the realities of homelessness and how easy it is to become homeless and also to dissuade them from leaving home prematurely just because they've had a tiff with their parents thinking that somehow the government will pick up the loose ends and provide them with a roof over their heads which of course is not the case. How and often is that the case? The, the, it's usually as a result of a, of a tiff as you put it. More often than you might think but a lot can be achieved through mediation and talking to the parents and talking to the children and getting them to stay where they're, they're best looked after. What are you most proud about with Housing Matters? I think we're most proud about the fact that we are actually very hands-on. We run on a, a shoestring budget and we achieve a lot for the money that we have to work with. You didn't choose to give oral evidence to the committee. Was I, there a reason behind that? I, not that I'm aware of. I, okay. don't, I don't even know if we were invited to do so. But I believe you've had written evidence. And certainly we've had um, ri written evidence through from, from Housing Matters. They've been very, very cooperative. And, of, of course, we would never, ever disclude them <laughs> from giving evidence. Right. Well, we hope today that we might get some, some thoughts to the populace. We're reaching sort of that time of the year, peace and will and all good to, to men and women. Um, so something may come out of this. GRI is an organisation supported by Erica here today. Same question as Don, really. What's, what is the aims of GRI? Uh, GRI, uh, they offer the most basic level of support to those who, who just are either homeless or um, on the outskirts of society. Uh, we provide, you know, a drop-in which offer food and, and drink um, relationships low-level support, uh, we give out financial help for um, deposits um, at a low level. Um, we do a variety of things. We're, we're, um, yeah, we kind of, where we see a need, we kind of try and help with that. With that. We sign post as well. The same as Don, are you aware of, of homelessness on the island? Oh my goodness, yes, yes. How? Um, the people who walk through our doors. Uh, we have people who have either been sleeping in their cars, uh, have been sleeping in car parks, um, plantations, uh, graveyards, uh, on the beach, steps of churches. We do have homelessness on the island. It is uh, definitely here. Yes, it is more hidden um, than, than, than you would see across. Um, but, I mean, the level of sofa surface on the island is really high. Um, you know, it is... Sofa servers, we better explain to people who are unaware of it, are people that sort of bed down with friends yes. and usually sleep on the sofa. At the mercy of their friends and family, so those who allow them to <coughs> stay in spare rooms or literally on the sofa. Um, it's, not, it's not 
Um, it's very temporary. It's it's not a solution. You have people who are managing to do it for a couple of years, and then they come to us saying their luck has run out. They can't do it anymore. Uh, we have they've people, run out of friends, basically. Or or the time that they've been allowed to have to to sort of uh, stay at people's houses. You know, it's as good as, as people's um, generosity is. You know, there's only so long that you can have someone sort of uh, staying with you. Um, yeah, yeah. Erica staying with us, as indeed Don is, right through to the end of the programme to discuss various things we hope between. Um, Neil joins us from the Alamand Food Banks. Um, are you aware of homelessness, poverty on uh, the island? Absolutely. I was uh, previously a director with Housing Matters and a hands-on manager for a while. So I witnessed that, but I still see it through the work that we do with the food bank. Could the island exist without the food bank? The island could exist in a very different way and in a much poorer way than the food bank. Um, you were asking what are we most proud of. For us, it would be the fact that we know we're making a difference. We know from our clients and we know because of the professionals that come back and say, you have made a difference in this individual's life or in this family's life. So what do the food banks do other well, than just offer food? Primarily, our aim is to help people who are in crisis, to give them a hand up, not a hand out. And our main function is to get people back to being independent, in control of their life, and get them out of that crisis. And to help with that, we supply the food as a bridge back to independence. Are people grateful? Absolutely. We have people come back and saying thank you. We have letters and cards from people. Uh, one of our clients came in with some gifts that she'd made for volunteers and uh, clients. So people say thank you in different ways. We also have clients that'll come back either to volunteer with the food bank or just to help around the building. Is food bank seen as a crutch? Do people need it uh, as to support them? And they think, well, we'll carry on walking with this crutch. Well, it depends who you listen to. Um, we had a politician on the island in the last several weeks who broadcast and when asked about the food bank said, well, I don't know what they're doing and I don't know if they give food to people who need it are to people who want it. Well, we do know, and it's only the cost of a phone call to get that information, but we take our clients through a very rigorous interview. We go through their history. We find out what's gone wrong, what's pushed them into crisis so that we can give them an action plan to get out of crisis. And we also look at income and outgoing bills and expenditure. We know what they've got left to spend with. So we work with a lot of families that might have between 30 and 50 pounds for a week for a family of four five or six and it's not sufficient equally we do say no to people for other reasons what's the reasons obviously uh, because you don't think they need help is that hard to do it it is hard to do the, the whole work is uh, an ethical endeavor because you're making decisions mm -hmm. all the time do i help this person do i help that who do i give food to who do we not give food to and and how much and for how long so there's a lot of decision-making going on there. But in terms of saying no to people, it's not because they don't need help. We identify sometimes that they need help of another nature and we'll signpost them on for that. And this is where you work with other organisations, be it government or be it charity on the island? Absolutely. Good man, thank you for that. Um, Tanya, as far as you're concerned, were you pleased to be invited onto the Committee for Poverty? Absolutely, yeah. It's um, something that I was quite passionate about, and um, my speech um, in Timwald, I think, um, if you'd have listened to that, um, would have, have indicated why. Um, I have a, an interest quite separately because um, my mother's from Central America. She's from Belize in Central America, and I've spent a lot of time out there. And I've actually seen poverty, um, like real, ab like absolute poverty. Um, and I, I've kind of, as a journalist, um, I suppose working at Manx Radio here, working over at um, 3FM as well, I've actually, I've been in contact one-on-one -on -one with some individuals on the Isle of Man that, that struggle in a similar way. And it frightened me because um, I didn't expect it, I suppose. So the more you look into it, the more you find out. Um, so I, I was quite keen to, to be able to actually be at the forefront, I suppose, of, of doing some real um, research into it. Jason, same as far as you're concerned? Um, I was rather surprised to actually be chosen. It wasn't something I'd 
thought a lot about previously and I'm really grateful I was chosen. Um, various constituents had mentioned issues. Um, I've been able to spend time at the food bank and talk, talk to people about these issues and do the research and I feel I'm coming to, I come into it like a lot of local people would come to it in terms of my awareness was minimal and in terms of what I'm seeing it's surprising. The comments that we've had is that people are not aware on the island of people sleeping rough. I'm assuming before you actually went onto this committee, you were the same opinion as the majority of the island. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I was aware there was an issue, but in terms of the numbers, that's a surprise. You know, we're not just talking of an odd person in passing. This is something that's affecting a lot of people, and it's you know it, it needs to be considered and looked at. You know, for the past number of years the third sector organizations have been doing this tremendous job they've been keeping things going and a lot of the other men have just had no awareness of what's happening so yeah it's eye-opening is keeping things going good enough historically that that's all we've been able to do because the government's not really taken the interest and the third sector's done what they could do with limited resources i think we are at a changing point though I think with the role of government coming in and saying, we need to look at this, we need to define the issue, we need to look at the people involved, we need to come up with solutions. You know, it's it's quite concentrated, quite intense what we're looking at. And the people I'm working with are really determined to get something out of it. So I'd be surprised if it was just a series of pieces of paper that we put forward next year. And, you know, I think it's going to be a real change, hopefully. Is money going to be a problem? Um. I think money can always be found, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Not a political statement at all there. <laughs> Have you been surprised by the evidence that you've been given on these two sittings of the Select Committee? Um, I, I think my awareness was increasing before um, last week, but I, I feel the time of the year's kind of had that extra impact. You know, you're going to Christmas, families are going around the supermarket, they're filling up, they're just buying huge amounts of goods. And I think last Tuesday and Thursday, just in terms of making us think this is this is different, there's something in the other man that's not quite as we expect, and that does surprise me, yeah. As far as you're concerned, Tanya, have your eyes been opened? Um, to an extent, much more than... Um, I mean, I, I had an awareness that there was a problem on the Isle of Man. Um, I certainly didn't expect it to be um, to the level that it is and certainly didn't expect it to be rising at the rate that, it, that it's rising. I mean, evidently there's there's that additional need. I'm sure that Erica later on will talk to you about um, the plans that, that Gry are having to expand. Um, it's it's evidently, if the need is there, then obviously the third sector are responding to that. Um, you know, our, our personal our interest as um, as uh, the poverty committee is to obviously investigate those definitions of poverty in various different circumstances. I mean, you've got so many different definitions that you can draw from, whether it comes from, um, you know, other parliaments around the world, whether it comes from the, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. There, there are so many different poverty, uh, poverty definitions to look at. Um, and so di many different methodological um, viewpoints that you might be able to take in measuring it. Um, but I think it's um, it's very, very important that we find um, what that word means um, to the Isle of Man um, in our own micro environment. So far, sitting on the committee, do you know what the word poverty means as far as the Isle of Man is concerned? I don't feel that my eyes are um, fully opened yet. I think that um, what we're doing essentially at the moment is a, is, is much a gap analysis in trying to find out where um, the provision is potentially lacking and whether or not an interve interventions can be made um, to assess um, the policies, the programmes, the measures that are in place by government to tackle it um, and um, to look at reporting back with some recommendations. Um, but at the moment, we're kind of at the point whereby we're looking at various different definitions of poverty, talking to people in the third sector and around government um, to, and to try and find out exactly what's going on. Um, and what we would um, obviously be very grateful for is, is those that are actually struggling with poverty on the Isle of Man to come forward and to talk to us. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do, but it one-on-one, it, um, -on -one, that direct sort of contact, if they would um, make a, a submission, even privately, um, be very, very gratefully received. Um, but, um, yeah, we do need to investigate the underlying causes. 
Neil, as far as you're concerned, you gave evidence to the committee orally. Yes. Did you find them supportive? Oh, absolutely. I was pleased to be asked and I was very pleased with their listening skills. Um, and I'm looking forward to how this develops in the future. There, there seems to be two words that relate to poverty. There seems to be absolute poverty and relative poverty. Yes. Which do you consider the worst of the two? Well, we see evidence of both. Uh -huh. there, there are people on the island um, who struggle in employment. There are people on the island who struggle on their benefits. And there are those, of course, who are not entitled to benefits. So they have major problems, and that's probably where I would see what we would class on the island as absolute poverty. As an organisation, we haven't put a definition on it. It's, we very much ta uh, tailor our work to the individual we're dealing with. As far as you are also concerned then, we, we write to poverty. Poverty is a bit different from homeliness. Poverty is what, for people who have got accommodation but can't afford possibly food, heat, things like that. Yes, poverty, for me, poverty is where somebody's having to make a decision of can I afford um, to heat or can I afford to eat? Can I afford to take get a bus in the Nobles because I've got an appointment for a CAT scan, but I don't have the money for that at the minute because I have to pay my rent. So where somebody's having to make decisions about how they use their limited income to meet their needs, I think poverty exists there. As far as you're concerned, Erica, relative poverty or absolute poverty? I think <clears throat> we'd be similar to what um, Neil has just um, commented on. Um, we would see both, really. Uh, we, we see people who, who are in accommodation, uh, who just don't have the finances to be able to afford uh, the basics in life. Um, you have those who... You, ha you have those who don't even have any heating in their house. They can't afford to, to heat it. They can't afford to um, have the electricity on. <laughs> so you have people who come to the drop-in uh, to get warm, uh, to have a shower, to, you know, just to, to have a hot cup of tea because they just they don't have the money um, to, to, to be able to, to do those things. And we also give out donations of clothing and toiletries and we do give sort of em emergency food parcels even though we're, we're not the food bank to those who are regular to us and we know their situation we would give emergency food to and those are people who aren't um, sort of sponging off us those are people who are in real desperate need is you know. the word sponge comes into your conversations quite a lot no I just made that one up now no you didn't <laughs> <laughs> it is a word and some people I have spoken to about food banks have said oh yeah they're just sponges can't be bothered to work You'll always get people, sorry, you'll always get people who try and abuse the system. Whatever system you have in place, you'll always have a few people, but they're the minority. The people who that we're, try we're trying to reach are the majority, and those are the people that actually, do you know what, I'd rather give the minority the little bits. If that's what they want to do, that I'm happy just to keep trying to reach the majority and actually get down to the, the actual real needs that are out there rather than policing it to the point where we actually are slowing the process down of actually helping the individuals that need the help or, or alienating those who are maybe too frightened to come forward because we're too stringent. You know. Neil, I should imagine you would agree with that. Statement. I'd agree, absolutely, yes. We, we'll, we'll, hear, we'll be challenged a lot by members of the public some politicians and others as to whether or not there's a need for the food bank and there are people with very strong views and will say it to their teams of that who are employed by them you know we shouldn't have a food bank on the island man it looks bad and I would say what looks worse for the island having a food bank supported by the public that gives out high quality food for seven days a week unlike a lot of food banks in the UK that are for three days a week or hiding it because it doesn't look good and it might affect tourism or business. As far as food banks are concerned, are they seen as a failure of government? No, I, I, I wouldn't say that. I think failure of government is failure to engage, but that's been addressed now at last. But there are still some senior people in government who hide from it or will tell their teams this shouldn't happen, not in favour of it don't want it. Do you see it as a failure of government, Tanya? 
Um, I think that that's a very, very big question without having all of the facts in front of us um, because we still haven't finished, obviously, gathering all of that evidence and doing that research. I think it's very, it's quite impossible to actually say. Um, I think that um, we do have a situation on the Isle of Man that could potentially be bettered by closer relationships with government, between government and the private sector, and the, the um, third sector, sorry. Um, I think it could be helped a great deal, um, but it's it's those sort of interventions not in terms of like direct contact between government and those that are in need but also between government and um you know um these organizations that we're talking about right now um that that need to be in in the best possible sort of communicative um position as far as you're concerned don could they be more helpful government from housing matters point yeah. of view government have been very helpful okay. um, we get funding without which we couldn't operate at the level we do and as Tanya's just said we have a good relationship a good working relationship on the island between government and between the third sector and that's very valuable um, going back to types of homelessness yes we see three types basically we see the sofa surfers which we've spoken about before and the other two categories are people who actually do not have a roof over their head and those who do, but it's very, very unsuitable. And by unsuitable, I mean people who are at risk.